Hi everyone, this is Pam Coey and I'm in my studio right now. I'm heading to University of Wisconsin in Madison in just a few days and I'm going to be giving an artist talk and I'm sure a lot of you have given artist talks or if you haven't yet, when you have an exhibition, you may be asked to give one. So I thought it might be useful to share with you some of the things I do to prepare for a talk. And in this particular case, it's about a body of work that I did between uh, 2012 and 2014 called Ubiquitous Migration of Pathogens. For those of you who know my work now, you'll notice that the work is very different from what I do today. It was an installation that originally showed at the Missoula Art Museum in Missoula, Montana. And the show ran its course and then moved on to the Nicolaisen Museum in Casper, Wyoming. And then a few years later, it went to Johnson & Johnson in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And from there, I was trying to find a permanent home for it. And because I graduated from the University of Wisconsin in Madison back in 1983, I contacted them and they were happy to take it. So now I'm going to be giving an artist talk. And how am I feeling? Well, I am going back to a campus that I haven't been to since I've been back to visit. But um, if you know my history, you know that is where I got my degree. And I'm going back there now to give a talk in front of a lot of scientists. And the talk will be recorded by Wisconsin Public TV. And it will be uh, in collaboration with this Wednesday night at the lab that they do every Wednesday, but this talk will be on a Thursday. So they've kind of changed the date for this particular talk. And not only that, my husband is a biochemist and he will be giving a lecture as well. So a lot of firsts for me, number one, giving a uh, lecture at this university, number two, doing it with my husband, and number three, doing it on a body of work that um, it's been several years since I've done it, so I've had to refresh my memory as to the different components and what inspired me. To make a long story short, it's taken some preparation. All I can really say in terms of preparing for an artist talk is if you, if you have a half an hour to speak, or they'll usually tell you how long you have to speak, it's definitely good to practice. It's good to practice in front of a mirror. It's good to have bullet points so that you're not just reading something. I usually have a slide presentation, which you'll see in just a few minutes, that helps me to not forget what I'm trying to say. It keeps me on track. And I'm going to be timing myself as I do a run through right now. I'm gonna use my iPhone and I'm just gonna put it on the uh, clock here and then hit timer so that I can keep track. I have about 30 minutes to talk. I'm hoping that Byron, who goes before me, will take longer, so I won't have as long to talk. Uh, but I hope you enjoy this, and I welcome your comments, uh, feedback. I'm, again, honored to be giving this lecture, but again, it's not, I'm used to talking to artists. I'm not so used to talking to scientists, so here we go. And this particular slide is for those of you uh, who might be listening to this practice run on YouTube. I put this slide in here uh, for anybody who might happen to either be near Madison, Wisconsin, or the call will be recorded by Wisconsin Public TV. It'll then be streamed live here at the, this website, biotech.wisc.edu. It'll be archived in about 48 hours. And location is going to be University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Genetics Biotech Center, um, 1111. And I believe there's free parking. If you have any questions, just let me know. I hope to see some of you there. And OK, so here we go. Here's the beginning of my talk. Ubiquitous migration of pathogens and how it came to be. Thank you very much for the introductions. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. It's, it's a tremendous honor for me to have this body of work now on permanent display at the Biotech and Genetics Building on campus where I used to be a student. Here is a, a schematic, an overview of some buildings that were quite important to me when I was a student here between 1980 and 1983. The lower arrow points to the biochemistry building. And that's where I met my husband, Byron. He was a graduate student in biochemistry. I was an undergrad and we did meet at this building. So it has some real significance for me. The top arrow is 
another building that most of us who attend the University of Wisconsin in Madison will know very well. It is Babcock Hall. And what does Babcock Hall do? They make lots of ice cream. And I have my favorites, and I'm pretty sure everybody in the audience here has their favorite as well. So here's just a little brief history. I attended the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I was pursuing my BS in biochemistry between 1980 and 1983. Around this time, uh, about two or two and a half years into the program, I met Byron, and I was again working in a lab upstairs, and he was a grad student downstairs, and we crossed paths. And when I met him, I think I realized what a real scientist was. He was very analytical and very logical, and as I continued on this course uh, for four years, by the time 1983 rolled around, I realized that I really wasn't uh, like Byron. I was very different and felt like my attributes were more in the creative field. So between 1986 and 2006, after we were married, I decided to pursue art, and art became a science for me. Uh, the definition of science is a study of, of a discipline and for anyone who has become an artist you'll know that um, art is quite a science and I had a lot of encouragement from Byron who also is a wonderful artist so I did that for about 20 years I started out with watercolor I really focused on one medium as our children grew up we have two boys and they're grown now but by 2008 they were going off to school and I decided that I also would return to the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana, and just take some art courses and try and fill in the gaps that I felt there were from being a self-taught artist for 20 years. So my intention was just to go there, take a few art courses, and you know, really enjoy that. Well, that turned into enrolling into the grad program and going for my MFA, which I did obtain in 2010. And it's important to note that between 2008 and 2010, there was a lot of my background in science that informed the exhibitions, including my thesis exhibition. And it was kind of ironic to have so much of that content coming back to me, but I really was relying on it quite heavily. Those years were full of identifying content in my work. And so if anybody's interested, I did a body of work called Disquietude, and it is on my website. So what was my inspiration for Ubiquitous? Well, after I got my MFA, and in 2012, so two years later, here's a picture of the Rocky Mountain Labs. This is where Byron works. It's in Hamilton, Montana. It's a level four facility, and they study about 30 or more of the world's deadliest pathogens. And I met up with Elizabeth Fisher, Olivia Mortimer Steele, and Anita Mora, and they showed me a lot of their electron microscopic slides that were either scanning electron micrographs or transmission electron micrographs. So they're two different ways of looking at various pathogens in different ways. And I saw hundreds of them, and I became very inspired. Here's a picture of some of these different slides that I saw, and again, I had hundreds representing all these different pathogens studied at the Rocky Mountain Labs. Here are examples of the scanning electron micrographs, and you can picture them as sort of like looking at the morphological top view, looking from the top down, and so on the left is salmonella. In the middle are the prion fibrils, which is what Byron talked about. And then on the far right is a scanning electron micrograph of Ebola. In this slide, these are different. These are done with transmission electron microscopy, TEM. And on the far left is pneumonia. In the middle is tick-borne relapsing fever. And on the far right is poliovirus. You can see how each pathogen has its own personality. That's what I was drawn to. The fact that, yes, these pathogens are deadly, but I'm seeing something that most people never see. And that is these pathogens up close and personal. So then, uh, around this time, I was also learning how to etch metals. My neighbor was a silversmith, and he taught me how to do this. And so I started to get this idea of not only being inspired by these electron micrographs, but what would happen if I etched copper plates. And so I did that. And in this particular grouping of plates, each one was three by three inches. And I submitted this to the Tacoma Art Museum, and it was shown at the Northwest Biennial in January of 2012. I then went on to uh, participate in a joint collaborative show at the Ravalli County Museum in Hamilton. 
it was a collaboration by Rocky Mountain Lab scientists and local artists. And we were all showing work that had to do with anything that related to science. So I had my microscape series, my etched metals and brass and copper. And then Byron also showed his work. And as I said, he uh, is quite an artist and these are his sculptures. Here again is Microscapes 3. I did three in the series and this one was the brass. The other thing that really inspired me was the fact that you couldn't really go a day without seeing something in the news about pathogens. Now this is a more recent article, this is 2014. But this one was talking about the Ebola outbreak. And then there were also articles about H1N1 and the Zika virus. This one was about an outbreak in Nigeria regarding polio because children there were not vaccinated and now they're having cases of polio popping up. And then this one kind of relates to something that I want to talk about in the next slide. This shows, you know, a cow that's being killed, a whole herd of cows, because they have been identified as having mad cow disease, which again is what Byron works on. And this was an important thing that happened after we uh, lived in London. We lived in London from 1983 to 1984. And in 1986 was the first evidence of mad cow disease. Well, the little red circle shows where Byron and I, after we were married, we lived in London, we both worked at the School of Pharmacy, and where that little red circle is, we used to go and get donor kebabs. So we got, it was a Greek Euros place, and we really loved it, and we would go there and grab dinner, and that was that. Well, then we left, and in 1986, there was this breakout of mad cow disease. So just so that you know, when we go and try to give blood today, they say, well, did you live in London? And I say, yes, we lived there from 1983 to 1984. And they'll say, you know, thank you, but we really don't want your blood. And the reason is because we lived in London. And that's where the mad cow disease uh, was a big deal. And they, they're worried that we carry this pathogen. Other brushes with pathogens. Byron was on a bicycle trip in France and he got Giardia. He later went to Nigeria, got Giardia again and lost about 20 pounds. And then our younger son lived in India for two years while he was pursuing his international baccalaureate. And at the very end of the two-year period, he wanted to go to Pakistan and visit a friend. He contracted Giardia along the way. And suffice it to say, he hasn't been the same since. So the third thing that really inspired me was whenever I was on an airplane and I grabbed the United or the American Airlines or Delta magazine that was sitting in the pouch in front of me, I'd flip back to the, the back of the magazine and see all these wonderful flight routes. And I just found them to be fascinating from an aesthetic point of view. And these images really stuck in my mind. So as I was um, inspired by these electron micrographs, at the same time, I was also inspired by the fact that we as humans can traverse the globe now without any trouble. What does that mean for the pathogen? Same thing. The migration of pathogens has really changed, and that is why it's in the news so frequently. And so all of these things really led to inspiring me to put together this large body of work, the electron micrographs, the flight patterns, and then the news, which was ubiquitous. So I had this idea in June of 2012 to submit a proposal to the Missoula Art Museum. And they do get a lot of proposals, so I didn't think my chances were very good, but I thought, well, I'm going to try anyways. And I submitted 20 slides along with an artist statement, and my proposal included this one fictitious slide that you're looking at right now. What is this? Well, my grandiose idea was to have three large etchings that were roughly four foot by six foot, and behind it to have some sort of reference to the world and that that would signify the migration of pathogens. However, expecting to really not be accepted, I felt quite safe in submitting this and thought it was a good idea. And lo and behold, they really liked this one particular slide, and they said, well, we would love to have you do this exhibit. So I had two years to figure out how to do this. The concept, migration of pathogens, was really the biggest challenge I had since attending grad school. And I really needed to do a lot of reading so that I felt like I had the knowledge to generate ideas and fill in the blanks that I had now with this uh, upcoming exhibition. So I read a couple of really good books, The Coming Plague by Laurie Garrett and Deadly Companions by Dorothy Crawford. 
And what I learned in summary is probably so obvious, but to me, it needed to be read and understood and digested. And, and that is that, you know, way, way back when we were just cavemen and we were hunter-gatherers, we were in small isolated groups, and it was very difficult for microbes to jump from one species to another. They were just isolated. But then we moved into the slash and burn agriculture. During this time, people were cutting down trees to make room, and they, they weren't as mobile. They wanted to settle down. And while they were felling trees, the biodiversity decreased. Animals were domesticated. People were actually sleeping with their animals in their little huts. So people moved around less, and the microbes had a field day. Now, fast forward to today. As you know, hitching a ride on a new host via modern transportation is super easy. Anyone who's been on a plane and heard somebody coughing behind you or maybe they you know, had a fever and the chills and they were sitting next to you, it's not a good feeling. You have this feeling that pretty soon you are gonna become sick as well. Microbes also defy the latest antibiotic and we have the anti-vaccination movement. We have an increase in population and climate change. And all of these things are causing microbes and pathogens to change, adapt, mutate, and evolve because it's a question of survival. So the three components that I decided that I would present in this exhibition in 2014 was to address the migration of pathogens. And I was going to call it ubiquitous because the, the term did come to me not early on, but a little bit later, but that is what it was called. And this particular large etched glass panel installation was going to be large scale, etched approximately seven feet by 13 feet, and then mounted in front of some sort of world map. But at the time, I didn't know what that was going to be. I also wanted to address the migration of man. And I envisioned this as being an installation, but of what, I wasn't really sure. What I did know was that I wanted to do drawings on gra with graphite on ground glass of all these pathogens that I had seen the electron micrographs of. I was very interested in that and I had just so many wonderful slides to, to work from. So that took me several months to do. Here is a schematic of what is now in the atrium at the Biotech Genetics Center. This is uh, etched glass. It's now in three panels and when I needed to figure out how I was going to do this thing that I proposed to the museum, I made a lot of phone calls. I tried etching glass myself. I had a beer glass and I tried to etch a logo on it and came out really, really badly. So I did make all these phone calls to try and figure out who in the country could possibly etch these large glass panels. And I was kind of coming up short. I wasn't really finding anybody right off the bat until I called somebody in New Jersey and I spoke with this person, his name was Wayne, and I explained to him what I wanted to do and he thought he could do it. So I, my part was to design the pathogens that would go on these large panels of glass. And again, I just, I looked at all these different slides. I chose the ones that I felt represented a diverse cross section ones that were commonly known so that when people looked at this and saw the schematic, they would say, oh, that's what pneumonia looks like. And then of course, their morphology needed to be interesting and, and aesthetic. So this took me about a year to not only submit my design to Wayne, but then have him etch it. Here it is being delivered to us. We lived on Roaring Line Road in Hamilton at the time, and it came in this large truck. There's Byron waiting to help unload it. Thank you, Byron. And here they are just getting it, uh, you know, they got it onto our trailer, got it up the driveway, and then they had to uh, unwrap the whole thing. It's quite large. And here it is in storage. So, you know, after I got these large glass panels, we didn't know what to do with them. So we popped them into the front windows here. They just had a, they were just basically propped up in there. So what would be a compelling way to convey the migration of pathogens using our world map? This continued to perplex me until six months before the exhibition opened. I really didn't know. I tried a lot of different things. I remembered those flight maps in the backs of the magazines. I thought about arching carbon rods. I thought about drawing. I thought about painting. I really, I just needed to think about it some more. And I was hoping that an idea would come to me. So instead of um, worrying about that particular portion of the installation, I moved on to the second portion, which was to address the migration of man. 
I asked 30 people, young and old, if I could cast their feet in plaster. I got a lot of strange looks. Most people said yes, unless they had a foot fungus or were really self-conscious about their feet. And you're probably wondering why I was going to cast their feet. Well, my idea of migration and the thought of casting feet, which is something that I, uh, I had some experience with because I was teaching a class in sculpture and we did a portion with alginate molds and we did some castings of our hands. And it was around that time that I thought, well, maybe we can cast people's feet. Well, feet are our main mode of transportation, assisted, of course, by wheels, rudders, and propellers. So that is how man traverses the earth. And as you know, pathogens can hitch a free ride. They can survive in new environments, leading to more virulent forms. And why did I use white plaster? Pathogens are anti-discriminatory, regardless of race, religion, age, gender, and size. And we are all created equal in the eyes of the pathogen. So I felt this would be an appropriate way to show the method of the pathogen and, and how they are anti-discriminatory. Here's a, a, some slides of some willing participants. I cast the feet of um, people who were very young, infants, all the way to 70-year-olds. I used a non-toxic alginate, similar to what dentists use to make dentures. And there's a two-minute setup time, so you have to put your toes into this squishy alginate. It's very liquid at the time, but then it sets up in about two minutes. And then you pull the foot out slowly, gradually, carefully, and then you mix the plaster, which has liquid stone in it just for strength. You pour it into the mold and you wait several hours and then you tear the alginate away and what you have is something very hyper-realistic. These were the toes and the way they're displayed became a very important thing about the show. I wasn't really quite sure what I was gonna do with the feet. I had some different ideas, but I had this frame in my studio and it had glass and I laid the frame down on the floor and I set the feet, the toes like this on top of the glass and I turned the lights out and I saw these shadows and I thought, well, that's kind of a cool thing because the shadows to me kind of look like pathogens. So that is how I displayed them. And then the, the last portion of this exhibition was going to be all these drawings that I did on ground glass, which I ground the glass with carborundum. It's just a gritty sort of compound and then I use graphite pencil. Sometimes I, I drew on mylar to get multiple layers. And the way that I framed these became an important part of the exhibition as well, which I'll show you a close-up of. So here are the different pathogens, chlamydia, plague, pneumonia, HIV, salmonella, herpes, parainfluenza, francisella, Ebola. And by the way, Ebola broke out right before my show was going to open in 2014. So here was the last part that was the puzzle piece that I wasn't sure how I was going to do this. I had six months left before the exhibition was going to open, and it finally occurred to me to consider the, the world map through the eyes of the pathogen rather than through the eyes of man. What I did was I, I had a map like this, I cut it into strips, and I recombined the world, and I came up with this. And so in this particular way of expressing the globe, which is what's hanging now in the atrium, it just shows that to the pathogen, the points of departure have now merged with points of arrival. It doesn't matter where you live. Because of our mobility, because of planes, trains, automobiles, ships, cruises, we can basically go anywhere around the world and the, the microbes and the pathogens just, they hitch a ride and they come with us. So um, where the red arrows are pointing, you can now see Russia from Canada and you can see that I've left some continents intact, like South America. You can still see Alaska pretty well. Uh, you can see India pretty well. But I tried to recombine the globe so that it looked just a little bit different because I was thinking I can't just do the typical world map. That would just be too common. So here I am in Byron's workshop, cutting the plywood, and then it's on our dining room table. And here it is, this is how it was presented again at the Missoula Art Museum for the first time in August of 2014. Here's a close up. What was important too about this installation was the way the light went through the etched glass and made shadows on the back wall because it 
gave it this feeling of multiplying the pathogens. Here's another view. When the show was at the Nicolaisen in Casper, Wyoming, you can see how I had the large installation piece at the end, the drawings hanging on the wall, and then there was this installation on the floor of the feet and the toes pointing up and all the shadows. This is where it was at Johnson & Johnson. They wanted the installation piece called Ubiquitous and they wanted the drawings, but they didn't think they could put the feet on the floor. They were worried that people would trip over them. And notice how the drawings are presented. It's kind of hard to see here, but they're in a bit of a shadow box. And because the drawings are, are drawn on glass and then put into an inset of a cradle panel, and Byron helped me do all this, they have a feeling of being sort of protected. They look like they're behind glass. They look like they're in a vault. And that sort of feeling of being a little bit careful because after all, these are deadly pathogens was part of the reason that I had a vision of framing them this way. So here is my website if anybody's interested in learning more about either this particular installation or anything else that I do now. And here is the recent installation of Ubiquitous at the University of Wisconsin in Madison in the atrium. So thank you very much for coming to this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Does anybody have any questions? Well, there you have it. That was a run through. It wasn't perfect. And I definitely want to add a few things to my slides. And, uh, you know, I probably will go over this another five, 10 times before I really feel very comfortable. And normally I wouldn't be um, prepping so much, but again, I'm a little bit out of my element here and I want to do the best job I can. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it to be entertaining. And um, hopefully I'll do a little bit better job when I'm actually there. And I know that a lot of people really are worried or scared about speaking in front of the public. But as my dad always told me, you know, as long as you really know what you're talking about, it makes it a whole lot easier. And when you're talking about your own artwork, when you have an artist statement and when you've put a lot of time into something and you've spent time preparing it and framing it and, you know, pricing it. By the time it's actually on view, you know, you are the expert of your own work. Nobody knows your work better than you. And I find it to be actually quite, quite enjoyable in that when it's artwork you're showing, I think it's really wonderful to hear feedback from people. I've always learned so much about my work and how it impacts other people and how they view it. And oftentimes it may not be the same way that I perceive it, and, and usually it's not, but that in itself is also very helpful to know that regardless of how we express ourselves, you know, if you can evoke a response in anybody, if they're asking you a question, that's a home run. That means that you've touched them in some way, that they overcame their fear of asking you a question. Remember, you're the expert and they're the ones that are sitting in the audience. They've just heard you, you speak about your work and they may be in a awe at what you've done because they might be thinking, wow, I couldn't do that. I couldn't be up there speaking, and there you are doing it. So keep in mind that if you do give an artist talk, you are the expert, you are in control. They know it's not easy. Have a glass of wine first and enjoy yourself. Encourage questions, and then just enjoy the moment because as you know with any show, it's over in a flash, and you may spend two years preparing for something. In a few months or a few weeks, the show is going to come down, and then you're going to take the work home that hasn't sold, and then you're going to work toward another exhibition, and then you go on and on like that. I think we as artists need to really sort of support each other and celebrate each other's wins, exhibitions. These are great opportunities to share our work with other people. And they're not easy to arrange or to work for. But in the end, you know, I, I do think that our art makes the world a whole lot better. And we convey how we feel about the world and how we feel about ourselves and everything else through our art. So that's what makes it so important and so wonderful. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.